This is a recording from the University of Virginia, brought to you by the Office of Engagement's Alumni Education Program. On April 23, 2009, Thomas Bateman of the McIntyre School of Commerce gave a talk on personal effectiveness of leaders, thinking and doing. It was part of the Engaging the Mind lecture series and took place at the Institute for Advanced Learning and Research in Danville, Virginia. Good evening, everybody. I, I really appreciate uh, seeing you tonight. Uh, I'm here in part because I was invited, as Althea said, uh, but I'm here also because uh, I, I came here about a year ago and uh, had a superb uh, time. Uh, the facility's so, so great, uh, the hospitality was so great, the people were so nice, and I was really pleased to be invited back and I'm happy to be back. Uh, when I was here last time, I talked about, uh, I talked about leadership. Uh, and tonight we'll have some leadership theme to it as well, but the focus is going to be very different. Focus is going to be on the first two words up there, personal effectiveness. And uh, as it says up there, uh, I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm kind of opening by making a point about the, the two keys to personal effectiveness being, uh, being a good thinker as well as being a good doer. Uh, if you think about it for just a minute, I, I can imagine you can think of people who are pretty, pretty good thinkers, but not, not really doers. That makes me think of professors, come to think of it, uh, thinkers, but not doers in a lot of cases. You can think of people who are active doers, but not necessarily all that thoughtful about what they're doing. Uh, we can think of people who are neither, I suppose. Uh, I don't think it's a big leap to say that those who are good at doing both are going to be pretty darn effective individuals and pretty darn effective leaders, people who are both good thinkers and good doers. So the theme is personal effectiveness, uh, relevant to leaders but relevant to everybody else as well. Uh, to put another phrase on it, uh, tonight is really focusing on self-management, man management, managing yourself, okay? We're going to cover a fair amount of territory. I'm going to speak kind of quickly in some places and slow down the pace in other, paces, in other places. We will uh, have time for question and answer at the end, but I also invite you to, uh, to interrupt uh, at any point, uh, civilly or rudely, whatever you feel like. But if you have a question or a comment to add, I'd be, be happy to, to, to break, uh, break the, the, the monotonous talk by one person and have a little bit more of a conversation. But anyway, our theme tonight, personal effectiveness uh, or, or self-management. Uh, uh, opening slide is making sort of the big opening points, uh, the, the overarching points I want to make about personal effectiveness. Starting with the first bullet point, that is to say that think, if you think about it for a minute, I bet you'll agree, so many of us go through so much of our lives at work and also life in general pretty mindlessly. We have habits, we have routines, we kind of do the same things we, we, we've done every day prior to today and we'll do pretty much the same kinds of things tomorrow that we did today and yesterday. Uh, it's, it's, it's sometimes amazing when you really realize how much of what we do, we do pretty mindlessly without really thinking about it very much. So uh, one thing I would invite you to do for the next hour is to, is to actually think about what we talk about. Uh, we're going to, as I say, cover a lot of territory, but I'm hoping by the time we walk out tonight, we'll, we'll cover a few bases. I don't, you know, won't remember everything we go over, but I hope you pick out a few things that are really worth thinking about, really worth carrying uh, away, uh, and taking action on, which is the last, uh, last bullet point right there, taking action. I was, I was driving down, you know, about an hour or so ago, uh, had some good tunes going and thinking about the talk, and, and I, I wondered about saying to you, um, if you take away several of the things that we cover tonight and actually do them, your personal effectiveness will ratchet up significantly. I, I feel like I can guarantee that. Uh, I've never said that to an audience before. I was driving down thinking, should I say that? I thought, no, that sounds too cocky. And, and, and heck, I'm not exactly a, a pillar of personal excellence. Uh, I, I don't always you know, practice what I preach. But I really believe that statement right there. If you and I actually act on some percentage of the thing we talked about last night, we can virtually guarantee we will increase our, our personal effectiveness. So I ask you to, to, to think hard and work hard with a goal of walking away with a few things to actually implement. Opening point, we do so much mindlessly instead of mindfully. Uh, the photo is up in the upper right. That's a, anybody recognize that? A Ford Model T. Henry Ford said, uh, thinking is the hardest 
uh, work there is. Perhaps that's why so few people do it. Uh, down here is Bertrand Russell, who said, most people would sooner die than think. In fact, they do. <laughs> and uh, in the lower right is William James, who is uh, arguably the greatest psychologist who most people have never heard of. At Harvard, the psychology building is named William James Hall. And he was turn of the century, 19th to 20th century. Not a real famous name, but a great, great psychologist. One of his lines was, uh, was uh, most people think they are thinking. Um, but all they're really doing is rearranging their prejudices. <laughs> Which is to say they're moving the furniture around in there, but not really changing the furniture or adding anything new, okay? So big, broad opening point. We, most of us probably think we think our way through our work days, but so much of, the, uh, of our work days, we're not really thinking very much. There's such a good thing as bad thinking, there's such a good thing as good thinking. I wanna make a big point about the importance of conversations which is to say, think together, get advice, get feedback from somebody else, be it in the workplace or, or, or in, work, in life more broadly. And then ultimately, as I said, I'm hoping you'll walk away with some of these things uh, uh, with, with an intent to, to actually take action. Uh, I'm gonna show a small number of cartoons to illustrate some points. Uh, here's a Far Side cartoon, I bet you know uh, the Far Side, Gary Larson, a great cartoonist who retired way too early. Here's a guy who probably thinks he's thinking, but uh, think about it for a minute. How well is he thinking? Ha, the idiot spelled surrender with only one R. I think a lot of times we think we're smart and we think we're thinking when we're being critical of other people. We can find something that makes us a little bit superior to them, in this case, spelling. But this guy is not doing a very good job of, of thinking about the important things or, or thinking, about, yeah, thinking about what really matters. Here's a guy, one more cartoon for now, no caption. But here's a guy whose concentration is incredible. <laughs> but I'm not sure he's doing a lot of thinking, okay? As far as he's concerned, he's thinking hard, concentrating hard, and he's gonna do one heck of a great job on his, on his job, but he's missing the big picture, as they say, of the things going on around him. So again, broad opening point. So much of what we do is rather relatively mindless. So much of what we do, we think we're thinking, but we're not really thinking as well or as fully as we should be, okay? So uh, one final thing about thinking, the importance of thinking together in conversation with other people. Alan Weber is an entrepreneur founder of uh, Fast uh, Company Magazine and publisher, the most important work in the new economy is creating conversations, which is to say that the world is too complicated these days, and no brilliant business person, no, no Albert Einstein of business, let alone of physics, can, can, can think of it all and know it all and do it all. You've got to tap the brains of everybody around you to deal with the complexity of today's world. One. Uh, I don't know, Cynic, I guess, defines conversation as a competitive exercise in which the first person to draw a breath is considered the listener. <laughs> which is to say that most people think they're in conversation, but they're not. They're in a, a debate where they're trying to beat the other person and win the argument, okay? So it's gotta be a good conversation, too. So. Uh, so real, conversa real conversation means real dialogue. It means open, honest communication. The point is not to defeat the other person in a debate. The point is to actually inspire thinking and learn from one another and hopefully come out of the conversation with a better idea, a more appropriate goal to pursue, a more effective strategy with which to pursue uh, the goal, okay? It requires skills in advocacy, which means exposing openly your thinking to the other person, and also inquiry, which means listening to the other person with an open mind. If you think about it for a minute, um, those are, you know, that's a short list of pretty powerful ingredients for a good conversation 
uh, that can generate greater effectiveness uh, in, uh, for, for all the parties involved. All right? So that's just, that's just some opening stuff. How much we do mindlessly when we should be doing things more mindfully. We also want to think at a, at, at a, at a, at a, at a, effectively as opposed to thinking ineffectively, okay? Uh, and ideally, you'll do all the better if you do your thinking out loud uh, in conversation with, uh, with some other people who's, well, who, who might be able to expand your thinking a bit, okay? So that's, that's some opening points. Now, really, uh, this stuff is all relevant to leadership, um, but the real focus is not leadership tonight. It's self-management. It's managing yourself, all right? Um, I think when most people think of self-management, they think of like time management and stress management and to-do lists and things like that. Uh, I, 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 we'll talk about that, those things a little bit, um, but not quite yet because when, well, psychologists and, and business uh, researchers uh, think about, about self-management, they start with these two things as probably the most important elements of self-management, goals and feedback. So one of the things I'm gonna ask you to do for the next little while, and by the time you walk out of here tonight, is think long and hard about what goals are you pursuing. Being personally effective starts with what are you trying to do? Starts with what goals are you pursuing? And I'm inviting you to, to think hard about what goals you're pursuing and uh, whether, they're, whether you're going after the right ones or whether you ought to, ought to reconsider and change or, or add to them somehow. The other big component of self-management is feedback on how you're doing as you try to pursue those goals. You gotta be able to figure out, am I on track or am I off track? All right, so goals and feedback are the first two uh, items here. Uh, and let's start, let's start for a couple minutes with goals now. I want you to think about, uh, or start with, let's start with the fact that we, everybody in the room, human beings are driven by goals. We have goals. We go after goals. And it's totally up to you what goals you go after, all right? Um, but the point I'm going to be making now is, um, are your goals the best ones or the most appropriate ones? I'm going to put up here a list of common goals. And uh, you might see yourself in some of those, or maybe all of them. They hopefully make sense to you as, as you see them. Some of them are relevant to you. Some of them are relevant to people you know. The ultimate point of the slide, though, is that even though so many people pursue those goals up there, they aren't necessarily very good goals. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I do want to make the point loudly and clearly about how often we pursue goals that aren't optimal, aren't as, aren't as uh, appropriate or powerful as they should be. So the first one up there, we all want to make money, I think. Uh, except for professors who only care about pursuing knowledge and truth. But uh, not too long ago, there were two bestsellers, one of which was all about how to die a rich person. And the other one was about how to die broke. <laughs> Both of them presuming that those are the goals that you ought to pursue. Everybody wants to be rich, right? So here's how you pile up a fortune. The point of the other book was, if you die broke, you have used your money optimally. You're not in debt. You don't have any left over. You have lived life to the fullest that money can do, can do you for, to turn a phrase, I suppose, right? So the point is, you know, the goal matters. Uh, and sometimes we're stepping back and thinking, what? what what do I want, what, where do I want to be financially at, at the end of my life? And you ought to pick wisely. You ought to, I don't care which one you pick. I'm not going to presume at all tonight to try to convince you of one thing or the other. But be aware of, whether you're, of what you're pursuing and ask yourself whether it's the right one. There's a metaphor. I don't know how well known this metaphor is, but they talk about people climbing the ladder of success. But then the follow-up is they get to the top and they discover that the ladder is leaning up against the wrong wall. They've been climbing up the wrong ladder all this time. That's the big point here. I'll be quick and efficient, I hope, through the other ones. I heard a couple of you pick up on the second one. 
people you know, have a goal of not saying something stupid. You go to an important business meeting, a cocktail party with important people, students in the classroom uh, have a goal of not saying something stupid. Well, guess what? A lot of people have that goal. That goal is very easy to achieve, right? By not speaking, right? <laughs> Uh, it, when I was in college, I was very shy, I still am, uh, but uh, I was w too shy in college, and I know this was in my mind when I was a college student, and I never spoke in class. I was a little too nervous and shy and didn't want to say anything stupid. Well, that drove my behavior. It's a goal that is easily accomplished. It is not a worthy goal, right? Your goal going into a meeting or a cocktail party or a classroom ought to be to say something interesting or creative or a contribution. Sorry. And, and, to, and, to, fi and to finish quickly, get, do, you, do you see a theme in the rest of them, in the rest of those goals about why they might be suboptimal? Anybody see a theme in there? They're doable is going to be at a pretty individual level as opposed to a group level. Well, that's, yeah, and I'll, and I'll broaden that to say, you know, I, I think all the, in many of the rest of the arguments, there are goals that people have, uh, uh, many of the rest of the goals. Oh. They're not long range, they're not big enough, they're not, uh, they're not a high enough aspiration. How often do you go through, face a problem and hope you'll find a solution? And then grab the first mediocre solution that comes along. You can, anybody can find a mediocre solution, but that's a far cry from the best possible solution. Uh, am, I, am I loud enough in the back rows now? Yeah, it's okay, thanks, thanks. Uh, do something doable is kind of a prescription for mediocrity compared to doing something great, right? And by the way, sometimes bosses, leaders, kind of crank back their employees. Someone comes in with a grand aspiration, and the boss says, yeah, sounds really cool, but, but that seems impossible. Why don't, you, why don't you tone it down a little bit and, and go for something a little more doable, right? So you, you get the point. The goal is suboptimal, right? How about winning the argument? You're in, a, again, a business meeting. Pretty soon, the battle lines are drawn. Some of the people want to do this, and some of the people want to do that. And the goal is to win the argument, totally losing sight that the real goal should be to find the best possible solution or to come up with the best decision possible, right? People, managers will tell you all the time, I try to implement change but all my people are digging in the heels. They, they just want to preserve the status quo. It is a common goal, but a suboptimal goal, all right? How about being decisive? Is there, I mean, on, on the surface, there is nothing wrong with that. Very valued in the business world, right? That's, that's very different from being a good decision maker, right? Very different. So that's the big opening point. Let's broaden this quickly to a more explicit business context. <laughs> Take a glance there and think about the point I've been, I've been making. Nothing inherently wrong with those goals right there. But what's wrong with cutting costs if you go too far? You know, it's easy to, get, to be good at cutting costs. It's easy to cut costs if you throw yourselves into it. But as you can anticipate, you cut too deep you lose service quality, you, might, you, might, you lose product quality, uh, et cetera. What's wrong with satisfying customers? They used to say satisfy customers a long time ago, right? Then they started saying exceed customer expectations, right? That's the next level up. Then they started to say delight your customers. That's the next level up yet. The point again is so often we just kind of go through the motions of mediocre goals as opposed to ratchet it up. What's wrong with beating a key competitor? Nothing inherently, but some of the great companies seem to be more focused on improving themselves and beating their last round of excellence. And their focus is more on, on how can we continually ratchet up our improvement. Beating a customer might be a kind of a lower level, level goal, okay? Nothing wrong with milking cash cows unless it gets in the way of innovation because you feel like you can keep riding the cash cows. Nothing wrong with trying to bring a project on time unless you get so focused on the schedule that you make the schedule with a mediocre product or project. 
compared to maybe an extra week or two, cranks up the excellence of the quality in a way that makes it worth it, okay? So a big point about goals. Um, I'm going to go uh, 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 and how, uh, how important it is to really know what it is you're pursuing. Occasionally think about what you're going after and think about whether the goal remains appropriate, as appropriate as it was you know, before, or whether that goal should be ratcheted up or changed in some way. Now, I'll be more efficient through feedback. So whatever goals you're pursuing, you want to choose them well. The other key part of self-management is to get feedback on how you're doing. And I'll start by saying most of us do a really lousy job of this. We figure we're doing fine. We're doing what we're doing because we think we're doing the right thing. How many of you enjoy getting feedback? Rhetorical question. Think of annual review time. Mo most of us are glad when that time of year is over, whether we're giving the feedback or receiving the feedback. There are people, though, who love getting feedback because they see it as a chance to improve. They say it, see it as input that will help them change their strategy so they can be more effective. What's up there now is uh, some of the common traps that people fall into. Do you know the phrase, the activity trap? It's being busy. You sort of look at yourself and you say, man, I'm really working hard, I'm really busy, I must be productive. You're sort of collecting feedback on yourself by checking out how hard you're working. But that, that's not necessarily valid or useful feedback. Being busy is not the same as being productive. Even being productive is not the same as doing, you know, adding value, as they say, in the best possible way that will make your employer never want to see you walk out the door. It's about adding value. It's not about how many hours are spent working and how busy you are. So as it says there, we, we passively assume we'll get feedback, but we usually don't. Sometimes we actively avoid feedback because we don't really want to hear the bad news, but we ought to seek it out. Sometimes we get some negative feedback, but we, we figure they don't know what they're talking about and we dismiss that negative feedback when we really should be uh, 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 thinking about it and learning from it, okay? So I'm not gonna read all these lines, but I'll ask you to, uh, to just glance over those lines right there and uh, think about yourself. This is kind of a notes to self moment as you think about feedback and do you, do you ask for it? When annual review time comes, you know, what's your attitude toward it? Do, do you use it? How do you use it? Uh, et cetera. All right. And finally on feedback, a few suggestions, starting with the first one. Speaking of, uh, speaking of setting goals for yourself, set a goal to get as much feedback as you can that will reveal the truth to you about how you're doing, which is the only way to make course corrections if you might, de uh, might, uh, might need to, okay? Check out that last bullet point. I, I bet there's not a business person in the modern world that hasn't heard it be said that you're supposed to learn from feedback. Think about it and learn from it. Uh, there are not many business people in the modern world who actually learn from it. It's usually in one ear and out the other, or it's a more active, uh, they don't know what they're talking about, uh, and, and, and no learning goes on, all right? Stepping back for just a minute with a cartoon. Again, thinking about the big goals you're pursuing. This guy to work. Later, Josh, these are daddy's peak earning years. I will show you, relevant to this cartoon, this piece of information. Psychologists have, have recently done a fair amount of research on the big life goals that people pursue. And that's a set right there of the big major life goals that pe people pursue. And it's becoming pretty clear, maybe you can anticipate or predict this, it's becoming pretty clear which ones seem to lead to the most satisfaction in life. And you could probably guess. Uh, psychologists and management you know, faculty talk about intrinsic rewards and extrinsic rewards. Extrinsic rewards are the things that other people give you, like money and fame and compliments. 
intrinsic rewards are the things that come more internally from what we do and how we live our lives. Uh, so the extrinsic rewards in this list are wealth and fame. The other ones are more intrinsic, more intrinsically gratifying. And there seems to be no doubt about the, relatively speaking, the positive effects of pursuing uh, personal growth and meaningful relationships and contributing to the community and, and spirituality, okay? One final point on goals. Whatever your goals are, think about what your goals are as you pursue your bigger goals and check out this distinction. Along the way to trying to achieve your goals, is your orientation more toward performing at a high level at every step of the way, or is it more toward learning along the way? Here too, a lot of recent research done on those two things. And here too, the advantages of a learning orientation have become very clear. So many people get so wrapped up in performance. One thing that someone that's really performance oriented tends not to do is tackle something that's going to be a stretch for them because they might fail and other people might see them fail. People with a learning goal organization, uh, orientation are always trying new things because they're interested and they want to learn and grow. And that seems to be a prescription uh, for a lot, of good, uh, a lot of good outcomes. Okay. Finally, on the point of goals uh, and, and doing, two, two quotes here. Lily Tomlin in a play says, all my life I've always wanted to be somebody, but I see now I should have been more specific. <laughs> that partly is saying, it seems you wanted fame, but, uh, but really she didn't really paint the picture about, of the kind of person she wanted to be. She didn't really set a goal with meaning behind it. Uh, that's for, actually from a, a book in a play called Searching for Intelligent Life uh, in the Universe. And Lily Tomlin was one of the actresses who had that line. Uh, another quote here, back to my, one of my favorite psychologists, William James, who said, if you care enough about a result, you will almost certainly attain it. Uh, and, and that too is a point about the importance of goals and choosing them properly, all right? All right, let's shift gears for a minute. And uh, so what, what I've talked about is thinking as opposed to not thinking goals, having the right goals as opposed to the sort of thoughtless goals, and making sure you collect feedback along the way, and learning along the way, right? Uh, now we're going to shift to a couple of standard self-management topics, uh, which, uh, which are time management and stress management, okay? Um, we'll start with time management, and a quick cartoon of what I think most people think of when they think of time management. First going to put up point that what time management is really all about is the, it starts with the fact that all day, every day, you finish doing something and you have to make a decision. I'm done with that, now what am I going to do? You probably do that hundreds or thousands of times a day. What am I going to go to next? I want you to think about that as a foundation for time management with the key to effective time management being what decisions do you make all day long with respect to what I'm going to do next, all right? So figure, be it on the job or be it in life in general, figure you've got hundreds of things you're going to do during the course of a day. How do you decide which you're going to do when and next, okay? Uh, there's a famous... Uh, perspective on this grid here. And you might, some of you might recognize that. I'm, I'm told that Dwight Eisenhower did this. I don't, I, don't, I don't know that for a fact. But here's the point to the grid. The point is, when you're making decisions, what criterion do you use in deciding what am I going to do next? Part of the point is, we usually have to turn our attention to the next urgent thing. There's always something urgent. And I got to do that now. Somebody's pressuring me. I got to do this. Somebody drops in and says, well, you got to do that, etc." The urgent things are the things that get our attention. Necessarily the important things that we ought to give our attention to, right? So this grid consists 
hundreds or thousands of things, tasks that we do during the course of a day or a week. And it says that every single thing, every single task can be described using those two criteria. Is it urgent or is it not urgent? And is it important or is it not important? Right? Um, so first, think about what quadrant you live your life in. And people who say or feel like they're not very good at time management tend to be living their lives in what? The uh, quadrant uh, three, which is everything feels urgent. I'm always firefighting. I can't turn my attention to the things that matter, the things I want to be working on, right? So the point of part of time management is to apply the criterion in your decision making of importance, not urgency. Apply importance as your choice criterion. Now, whether that sounds like common sense or not, I don't know, but consider this. Again, all day, every day, you're making these little decisions. Think about what criteria you probably use during the course of the day. Given a choice, would you rather start doing something you enjoy doing or something you don't enjoy doing? As human beings, we'd rather do something we enjoy doing. Would you turn your attention to something you find interesting or something you find boring? Something that's easy or something that's hard? Something you've done before and you know how to do or something you've never done before and you're not quite sure how to do it? Something that'll take a long time or something you can get done in five minutes so you can check it off on the to-do list? You, you get the point, I think. None of those are the same as importance. So the point is to try to let importance be the criterion that overrides those other things. Now, I'm not saying never do things that you like and never have fun and stuff like that. But time management starts with the, the little decisions you make all day and all week long. And to get a handle on it, think about what criteria you apply and try to apply the important criterion uh, more than you perhaps uh, have done, okay? So, so j just a little thought-provoking question here. In, the, in that matrix, you know, ask yourself what quadrant are you in? Which quadrant would you want to lead your life in? And I will say quickly, one of the most important uh, aspects of leadership and management and work life is, is, is the act of delegating tasks to people. And I would urge you to think about yourself as a delegator. Do you delegate as much as you should? Do you delegate as well as you should? Uh, people who are overloaded at work um, often could offload some things as one quick and easy example of better, better time management. By the way, that monkey reference right there, uh, there's an old, old Harvard, review, uh, Harvard Business Review article called Managing Time, Who's Got the Monkey? It's from like the mid-70s, I think. Um, yeah, and uh, there's a, uh, there's a uh, you know, the, the metaphor of a, a monkey on your back and drug problems, they say, is a, a person has a monkey on their back. Monkey's apparently being real strong and it's hard to get them off your back. It's a metaphor for a problem. In the, in the Harvard Business Review article, the picture is, a, is an executive with a whole bunch of monkeys clinging to him. Uh, legs and arms and back and shoulders and head and everything. The point is to think of every task as a monkey. And maybe you can give one, one monkey off to that person and another monkey off to that person. And think how often your employees upwardly delegate to you things that they maybe should be doing. So it's like, hey, hey boss, can you give me a hand with this? And you say, yeah, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> that person is just effectively delegated up to you and you've got one more thing uh, on your plate. So anyway, broadening, broadening this perspective, broadening this perspective. Um, let me just say that, uh, well, I'm going to broaden the perspective in a minute. Uh, we're going to cycle back to time management when, for, when I first I talked about job stress and the causes of job stress. I th they're pretty intricately related, it seems. Take a look at those phrases for a minute. I don't know, I don't know what you think of when you think of stress, but I, I think we think of individuals who seem to always be stressed. And we, I, th we sometimes have a tendency to chalk it up to their personality. Somebody's got a, pers a stress personality or somebody's got a low stress personality. But a point I want to make here is uh, forget personality for a minute. 
so much, it, you know, you've heard people say stress comes from within, from inside you, and stress is about how you interpret things and stuff like that. The uh, point I want to make now is, and the fact is, stress comes from the stuff that is coming at us, that is happening to us. And so, so for this little bit, the word refers to what expectations people have of you. And with an opening point on stress being that a lot of stress comes from other people's expectations for you. And can you deliver, can you live up to their expectations? So if you look at those other words, I'll bet they're pretty self-explanatory. Role overload, too many expectations. You're just overloaded. Too many people demanding too many things of you. Role ambiguity, it's ambiguous. You don't, you don't understand what you're supposed to do. You've got a job to do or an assignment from a schoolwork assignment that maybe you don't know how to tackle it to a work assignment that's important but you've never done it before and am I gonna do this okay and where do I start? That's role ambiguity. And then role conflict is conflicting expectations. And you're caught in the middle. Your job, your boss wants you on the job, your family wants you to spend more time at home. You're caught in the middle between work and, work and family. Your boss wants you to crack down on your direct reports, but your direct reports want you to go easier on them. You can't do both. You're caught in the middle. I'm going to regret this, but the best example I've ever seen of role conflict is from the greatest movie ever produced in Hollywood. What do you think of when I say, Gone with the Wind, okay, all right, second greatest movie. <laughs> what do you think of when you think of all time great movies besides Gone with the Wind? Star Wars, jeez. I'm looking, for, I'm looking for some scholarly response here, okay? I'm talking about the fly. And I'm, t and I'm talking about the original version. Who said that? I'm talking about the original version, 1959 or 60 with Vincent Price, right? Thank you for your support with that. I can see I'm going to have to educate you on this. I'll try to make this quick and then we'll push on, but uh, quick background, Vincent Price, even the, the younger people know Vincent Price, one of the all-time great horror movie actors, huh? No, did he? Uh, are, okay, all right, okay, the comment was he went to college around here, maybe UVA, okay. Uh, in this movie, the movie begins, I'm going to regret this. I'm already, I'm already embarrassed. Vincent Price, instead of playing a ghoulish horror guy in this movie, is a regular guy whose sister has just murdered her husband in a hydraulic press in their living room. A gigantic hydraulic press. And the police, and, and she is stunned and unable to communicate, and the police call in Vincent Price, her brother, hoping, some of you are smiling like this could be interesting, and some of you are looking like, what? <laughs> where are you going with this? I'm sorry, Althea, but I'm in too deep now. So she's not speaking, the police can't, can't get her to talk, they, and they find out she's got a brother in town, so they call in her brother Vincent Price to try to get her to talk, and she starts to tell the story of why she murdered her brother in a hydraulic press in her living room. Uh, and now the movie is a flashback. Uh, it starts with a happy, beautiful young family in suburbia. The woman, her husband, and their young son, a beautiful family. The father, husband, is a brilliant scientist with a basement laboratory. One night at dinner, after dinner, he says to his wife, you won't believe what happened at the office today. The laboratory, come on down to the basement. I want to show you what I accomplished today. So they go down, and in one room of the basement is a giant vacuum tube. 
And uh, he says, watch this. And he opens the door and he puts an ashtray in the vacuum tube and closes the door and turns on the light and there's a brilliant flash of light. And then it dies down and the camera looks in and the uh, ashtray has disappeared. And she is astonished and he cockily says to her, come on to the other room. And they go to the other room in the basement and there's another giant vacuum tube. And they look in and there is the ashtray. He has figured out a way to transport matter from one place to another, right? Very cool. Uh, well, we're at the next day and at the next dinner table, and, and it's another nice evening, and the guy says to his wife, guess what? I've made another advance. Come on downstairs. They go downstairs. I've got to start talking fast and get through this. Uh, they go downstairs, and he, they, he grabs their little kitten, and he puts the kitten in the giant vacuum tube, turns on the light. There's a gigantic flash, and they're going like this. The mother's mortified. Uh, the thing dies down, there is no kitten, and she's really worried. He says, don't worry. They go to the other room, they look in, and there's the kitten in the other vacuum tube slurping up some milk, and you can hear it purring, totally contented. He has now learned to transport a uh, living creature through thin air to the other thing, the other place. Well, can you imagine the next, uh, he's thinking entrepreneurial now, entrepreneurial Lee now, and the transportation possibilities, et cetera. So, he, I'm almost to the end of this uh, digression <laughs> that you forced me to do. Uh, now, he, unbeknownst to his wife, he steps in the vacuum tube himself, closes the door, but flips the switch somehow. There's a blinding flash of light. It dies down. He's not in the vacuum tube. The camera moves over to the other room, and he has reemerged in the other vacuum tube, okay? Uh, now, unbeknownst to him, when he got in, a little fly got in the tube with him. And the way this thing works, by the way, I'll try to de-technicalize it for you. Uh, they break down all the molecules and then reassemble the mo molecules on the other side. When this happened, the molecules all got mixed up and reassembled. And on the other side now, we've got a giant man with a giant fly's head and a little fly with a little tiny man's head. <laughs> and the giant man's body opens the door. The little fly flies out and out the window out in the neighborhood. And the man is left with this giant fly's head. Now, the good news is, the, even though it's a fly's head, the man's brain is still in charge, all right? <laughs> which, is, which is when I started thinking, wait a minute, this can't be a true story. Uh, <laughs> But, but over time, the fly's brain is starting to take over, all right? So he, while he's still in control, he sends a note out to his wife. He locks the door, sends a note, says, dear honey, you want to, can't believe what happened. Send our, little, our cute little son out in the neighborhood with a butterfly net and look for a funny looking little fly, see if you can catch it. Uh, and meanwhile, slip me some soup under the door, uh, which she does, but she's stressing out, not knowing what, he's wearing a pillowcase now, uh, uh, pillowcase now over his head. Oh, as I said, over time, the fly's brain is taking over, all right? Well, she can't stand the suspense anymore. She breaks into the basement, breaks through the door. He's there with a giant, with a pillowcase on. She runs up to him, whips off the pillowcase, and there's you know, the greatest scene in motion picture history, a giant fly's head with the proboscis pumping up and down, and she screams, all right? Um, now, he grabs her, and the, the fly's brain is slowly taking over, right? There's still some man brain going on. He grabs her with one hand, grabs a piece of chalk with the other hand, and on the blackboard he writes the, word, the, the letter I. And then he also has a fly's left hand, okay? The fly's left hand grabs the man's hand and rips it away from the blackboard. He fights it off. He gets to the blackboard, he writes the L and the O. And the fly's hand comes back. And ba he's bouncing back and forth. He fights it off again. He gets the V and the E. He's writing, I love you. And then all of a sudden, the fly totally takes over. It goes on a rampage. But at least the man got the last message out to his wife that he loves her, OK? <laughs> now that is role conflict. <laughs> Uh, caught between conflicting expectations. 
And trust me when I say this, you cannot be both man and fly, all right? Uh, I, gave, <laughs> I gave that a little time in part because it's a pretty important concept and a pretty important source of stress. Different people are demanding different things on you and you cannot satisfy everybody, all right? Uh, by the way, just to wrap it, uh, the end of the movie, uh, now the story is out, Vincent thinks his sister is crazy and they call in the guys in the white suits to take her off to the, to the farm. Uh, uh, but, uh, and now at the end of the movie, Vincent is forlorn, of course. He walks out in the garden and he sits down. I wonder if anybody remembers, remembers the finale. He sits down in the rose garden. It's a beautiful, you get your beautiful day. You, <laughs> beautiful day. Roses are out. He sits down on the bench and he hears, he's all upset. And then he hears this high squeaky voice. Can you, somebody do it for me? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And, bl and believe me, I can't thank you enough. <laughs> High squeaky voice saying, help me. And, 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 he, and, he, and he shakes it off. He looks around, he doesn't see that he shakes it off and then he hears it a little louder. Help me. And he looks around and there is the fly in a spider's web and a big old spider bearing down on it, gonna eat the fly. And he, he picks up a rock and he smashes it. He kills the spider and the fly. Um, but the good news is, he now knows his sister was telling the truth, and she's not crazy, and that's the happy ending to the, to the movie. <laughs> and she went on and got a, a law degree and a CPA, and uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, now, forgive me and thank you <laughs> for, your, for your patience on that. Here's where I'm going about this. Those are three common types, very common types of stress being overloaded, not knowing what to do when important things are expected of you and being conflicted, I can't satisfy everybody here. I don't know if you read articles about stress management, but can you think about it for a minute and what the magazines say? There are always articles on this topic in business magazines and in Cosmo and Guns and Ammo and, and, uh, and all these magazines. There are always things about stress management and what do they say? They always talk about nutrition and health and exercise and sleep, diet, they might talk about meditation, they might talk about biofeedback. You know what, they all, all, those are all valid things, but they're all about toughening up and being better able to put up with the stuff that's happening at you or to you, right? Here's the bigger point, here's the big point I wanna make, is it says here they focus on making you stronger and better able to survive the stress that, that's coming at you but they don't much talk about the things in your circumstances that are causing the stress and you can maybe change them, okay? So I'm saying now as I wrap on stress management and we're getting into the home stretch now, the key to stress management is those things I just said, getting healthier and better able to deal with stuff, but it's also sorting it out, identifying what are the things that are causing me stress and then taking action on the causes of stress. So for example, role ambiguity. You've got a major assignment and it's amb uh, ambiguous to you, you're uncertain as to how to do it. Well, instead of wallowing and worrying about it, ask some people, get some feedback, ask for some suggestions, get some clarity. That's the beginning of dealing with your stress and performing better. Role conflict, the man wants you to be one thing and the fly wants you to be another thing, you can't be both. Well, you can wallow in that stress, you can take some time to get in better physical shape to put up with it, but what I'm getting at here is you can take action to reduce the conflict. So you make a decision, maybe I'll do, maybe of the two people that are demanding different things of me, one criterion you can apply is which one is more important and powerful and I make a decision, I will do what he or she wants me to do. Or you can apply a criterion of which one I agree with and which one fits with my values or my opinion or preferences and then go with that. A third option is to talk to the people involved and talk about the conflict and maybe renegotiate or find some common ground or whatever. 
as I say that, it strikes me that that might sound pretty commonsensical, but you know, the fact is most people don't think to do that, or maybe they think to do it, but they don't do it. They just complain about their stress, and, and it can hurt their health, all right? Now, quickly elaborate, I mean, the slide will elaborate a little bit more about the stress of overload, which is routinely the most commonly cited cause of stress on the job being overloaded. Just take a glance at some of those things that are actions that will help you prevent or avoid overload. And then the next thing up there are actions that can be taken to reduce overload once you've got it. The big broad point is these are all about action as opposed to hoping I can put up with this stuff and survive to the other side. So I won't elaborate on all those, but, uh, but I will mention the 80-20 rule. Do you know the 80-20 rule? I mean, it, it, it's used in a lot of ways, including economics, but the point here is that they say that 80% of your value to your employer derives from 20% of your responsibilities which is to say you've got a million things to do on the job. Most of them are not terribly important. A core of them, the 20%, are vitally important. So this is saying, think it through, identify the core 20% that you've got to perform brilliantly at, maybe at a world-class level, and focus your attentions and energies on that and perform as brilliantly as you can. The other 80%, not as important, not worth being a perfectionist about. Maybe you can delegate them. Maybe you can do a kind of a half-baked job, but it's good enough because it's inconsequential because they're just not that important. All right? Now, moving on to a couple more points. I want to make a big point with regard to self-management of the importance of thinking long-term. It's a short-term world. <laughs> Performance is expected of us, and is usually expected of us in the short term. And if we're needed, we got quarterly pressures, et cetera. It's very much a short-term world, but a real key to self management and personal effectiveness is to think long-term. This is not quite what I mean. This is what I mean. And it's back to the point of uh, the fact that we all make decisions all day long. And every week and every month we make, we make important decisions. I'm going to make a point about decision making with respect to short term versus long term. All right? With apologies to any dentists that might be in the crowd, think about the decision you face on a quasi regular basis about when and whether to go to the dentist. Oops, I skipped ahead, sorry. Time is marching along the bottom axis. On the vertical axis is pain. How much pain is associated with going to the dentist, all right? See if you can picture this. If you're facing a go, no go decision. Do I make an appointment and go to the dentist or do I not? Think about what the graph would look like. Why does that keep happening? What the graph would look like for going to the dentist today. To go to the dentist today is to realize a spike in pain. May, not necessarily physical pain, but maybe but discomfort at least, and being in the chair when you don't want to be in the chair when you'd rather be on the golf course or whatever. The option of not going to the dentist has that pattern right there. No pain in the short run, unless maybe a little guilt because the six month point has come and I should go. But the more I put off the decision, the more likely greater pain is gonna come down the road, right? This is a short term, long term, Classic choice right here. We make decisions on the basis of reward, pleasure, and pain to a great degree. 
If we're making our decision point today in the short run, we're more likely to opt for no pain instead of high pain, right? It, what the crucial thing is to think about the long-term consequences if we decide not to vi visit the dentist. We can generalize that easily. I bet I'm not the only one in the room who, who tries to lose weight sometimes. A piece of chocolate cake presents itself. You know, it's all about willpower. The pleasure is the short run of enjoying the chocolate cake, and then the pleasure is over with. But that is no way to lose weight for the long run, right? Exercise programs, uh, I don't quite feel like working out today. It'd be too painful, it's too hot, whatever. But you gotta think in terms of the long-term consequences that over should sometimes override the short-term consequences. Just getting up out of bed early in the morning for class. If you can get away with cutting class, it's painful to get out of bed, but the long-term consequences will go against you. I, I guess I have to mention alcohol briefly. There are people, I'm told, who enjoy drinking alcohol. They say it's pleasurable in the short run. When that high pain point comes, they tend to say, never again, right? So I just want to make this graphic point. Uh, personal effectiveness comes from thinking long term, remembering about the personal choices, OK? All right, I'm going to just push on to the end and say one of the things we've talked about, conversation. The importance of knowing your goals and choosing them wisely. The importance of seeking feedback and, and using it effectively. Some ideas about time management. Some ideas about stress management. Most of these, by the way, uh, uh, the importance of a long-term focus. Most of these, by the way, revolve around the fact that we are making decisions all the time. And we so often use the wrong criteria in our decision making. OK? So we didn't do those last two things right there. but. Coming to a close here, you talk about it in a lecture or a classroom, and we're throwing out ideas, and I hope, I hope a few of them caught you, know, caught you and you'll remember them. But uh, there, there's actually a book called The Knowing Doing Gap, which is intended for business people. The big point is, you know, we know this stuff. Business people have resources everywhere that'll tell them what they're supposed to do. The things I've said today, I mean, you all know probably that goals are important, feedback's important, the long term's important, but there's a big gap between knowing something in your head and actually taking action on it. So what I've got in that last portion of this slide is trying to make the point that, uh, you know, people in a lecture or in a class, sometimes they sort of think, yeah, I know that stuff, or I've heard that before, yeah, that makes sense. And you kind of get sucked into being a little complacent. Yeah, I know this stuff. But what's here is a kind of a ladder from just barely knowing it and quasi using it, marching up the ladder to actually living some of the good ideas you might hear in a, in a lecture. I think, I, I honestly, I think business people do this all the time. They've, they've heard customer service. Um, you know, till they're sick of it. Everybody knows how important customer service is, is, but we all know how many companies don't deliver very good customer service, and we all know what a competitive advantage it is when a company actually lives it. You might have heard the word empowerment, an empty buzzword, the way most companies throw it around, a very powerful, profound thing when, uh, when it's actually done uh, well. Setting your goals properly, getting feedback, thinking long term, making the right kind of time management et cetera, uh, decisions, et cetera. Those are high leverage things uh, that, that don't offer much leverage if, if it's all, all talk and no action. OK? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with two, thing, uh, two, two things. Ignore, yeah, it, it just look at that, that, that lower picture right there. Um, I actually mentioned this last year when I was here talking about leadership. Uh, but I think it's a useful thing to say again, if for those of you who were here last time, and, and, and a lot of you are new. But in all seriousness, a great motion picture is uh, Apollo 13, 
that I bet most of you have seen. Uh, in part, it's a great motion picture because it's a true story. Uh, and uh, it, as you recall, it, it was the Apollo moon program. Uh, Tom Hanks played Jim Lovell, uh, the, the commander in the capsule, as three guys were going up to the moon, and one of the guys was going to walk on the moon. Uh, I, I've, when, I've, when I've done long executive program, management programs, like two-week programs, with an interest in a change of pace, uh, I have sometimes shown the entire movie because of, of all its examples and lessons for leadership and management. And if you think about it, there's great leadership up in the capsule by Tom Hanks as Jim Lovell. There's great leadership on the ground uh, by uh, Gene uh, Kranz, played by, uh, uh, who's the actor, H Harris, uh, what's his first name? Yeah. Ed Harris, thank you, right. It's decision making, it's crisis management, it's leadership, it's teamwork, it's problem solving, it's communication, it's all kinds of stuff. Uh, so I've shown the whole movie and then asked people to pull out the lessons. And if you recall, some of the classics are uh, failure is not an option, right, uh, is a classic, right? Uh, there's all kinds of other stuff. But, but here's, here's my favorite lesson from that movie, and it's one that the executives don't tend to pick up on. Do you remember early in the movie, uh, the, very, the very first scene, all the astronauts and their families are in Jim Lovell's house watching TV. They're watching Neil Armstrong walk on the moon, the first person ever to walk on the moon. And uh, it's a very moving moment. And it's, it's just super cool. And three of the guys know that they're going to be next to, to, to go up there to the moon. Well, the party ends. You know, Walter Cronkite is you know, crying and getting choked up and stuff. And, it's all, all cool stuff. The party ends, and Jim Lovell and his wife go out on the patio, recognizing this, on the back porch or something. And it's a beautiful night, clear night. And the camera is up on the, moon, on the full moon. And we're all supposed to be, and, and Marilyn, his wife, is actually feeling kind of frisky, if I may say. Uh, and it's just very romantic, and she's feeling romantic. He is not feeling romantic, apparently. He's going to be the next one up there. So we're, the audience and Marilyn are thinking, isn't it beautiful, isn't it romantic, and somebody just walked up there. Uh, well, Tom, Lovell, Tom Hanks, as Jim Lovell, says, you know what, Marilyn, it's not a miracle that someone just walked on the moon. We just decided to go. He said, we just decided we're going to go. And of course, you know, less than 10 years later, John F. Kennedy decided we're going to put a man on the moon. Less than a decade later, a man is walking on the moon. So while everybody is thinking it's a miracle, people have been thinking about this for millennia, Tom Hanks says, no big deal. We just decided we're going to go. And now we're there. That's the point. That's the key link between an idea in the classroom or in your head and actually acting on the idea, making a decision. This is something I'm going to walk out of here with. And this is something I'm going to work on and apply. The link from thinking or knowing to doing is making a decision. It's not, wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't it be nice? Boy, I wish. It's deciding I'm going to get better at time management. I'm going to take action on my stress management. I'm going to think about my goals and talk to others and get feedback, whatever. Making, uh, picking some things and making a choice. Okay, well, I thank you very much for coming and for your attention and comments. Thanks a lot.